What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Melissa Magonzo Murphy, pronoun she, they, and sis. Super excited about this episode today. But before we get started, you know I have to introduce my co-host, Emma. How you doing, love? Hey, hey, Melissa. Welcome back, everybody. Emma Wadiak here from the Career Center over at Sac State. And today's episode is so important. I cannot stress that enough because today we are talking about employment following incarceration. Yes. Very yes. big deal. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we have to start with our career myth before getting started. Mm -hmm. So today's career myth is if I have a criminal record, I am not able to get a job. This is actually something that I hear a lot from yeah. folks that, you know, have a hiccup in their record or were just impacted by the justice system and just feel like life cannot happen for me after this has happened. Right. Like this is the end all be all. If this has impacted me in any way, I do not have a future for moving here on out. And so I think that's why it's important to talk about it today. I think another big thing is that a lot of people aren't aware of how common mm -hmm. this is for people. So I'd mm -hmm. like to share just a few stats. Oh, yeah. So 2018, a group called the Prison Policy Initiative did a study to try and get a feel for how pervasive this is within the United States. So some stats that we have from that are there are about 5 million formerly incarcerated people in the U.S. So this is a big population that we're speaking to from the get-go. For those 5 million people, the likelihood of them being unemployed is 27%, Huge. which compared to the general population is like five times greater. That's huge. That's massive, right? So... Obviously, there's a lot we need to do in terms of reform and making the process more equitable. Right. But I think for the sake of giving listeners a scope of what this looks like, it's important to have some of those statistics in the background. I mean, that means even if it's not you, right? That could be a family member. It could be oh, a yeah. classmate. It could be... You know, it could be you in the future and you just did not, you don't know it yet, right? Right. Because right? we don't know what happens from day to day, from week to week, because, you know, things happen. Mm -hmm. So this information is going to be beneficial for everybody. Totally. And I think especially, too, for people who are in positions of making Hiring decisions. Hiring decisions. Absolutely. Hiring decisions, right? Because Absolutely. Because if you are not yourself directly impacted or maybe don't have a family member who's directly impacted, you may one day be the decision maker who's trying to evaluate like, hey, do we do we hire this person? Is this a deal breaker for me? What does that mean for our company? Right. So all of those things are going to to play a part and be important. Absolutely. So with us today, we are very excited to have Alton Williams join us. Thank Welcome. You. Yes. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And Alton is a professor here on Sac State's campus in the criminal justice department, but is actually the program coordinator for Project Rebound on campus as well. So welcome, Alton. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Yes. Thank you. So Alton, to get things started, would you mind sharing a little bit about your own educational and employment journey and just giving us a feel for what Project Rebound does here on campus. Cool. Uh, no problem. Um, my educational journey uh, and my employment journey. So for me, like I'm from Oakland, Oakland, California. Okay. And it was kind of a trip to see the, the difference between the system out there and then the system out here. Mm -hmm. And so the high school that I would have graduated from in Oakland graduated 41 people. Okay. Right. Which was roughly equivalent to <clears throat> how many students we had at the college. I mean, the, um, high school that I graduated in Sacramento, mm -hmm. but uh, where we had like 250 people graduate. So um, it was a stark contrast, and I seen the difference in th what was invested in education. So it was super important, and it was definitely a change for me. But uh, my educational journey, once I graduated from high school, I went on to community college, and um, I was there a little longer than I should have been. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I, ended, I graduated from there. Transferred to Sac State, where I got my uh, BA in SOCH and my master's in SOCH. Another SOCH graduate. SOCH graduate. You and me, Alton. <laughs> yes. We got it going on. We do. So, <laughs> definitely. And so my employment journey, though, is essentially parallel to my educational journey. Okay. So outside of um, education, I probably had one job. My mm. Every other job that I had, it was like I was in college 
and by me networking and talking to professors after class and just you know getting involved on campus, I was able to secure pretty much all my jobs were uh, on campus in some um, capacity, right? So either I was a tutor, uh, I was part of a, I helped run a bridge program for uh, teams that were coming out of uh, high school and mm-hmm. going to college. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up being, uh, I was a, I should do surveys at the ISR. Uh-huh. When I came to Sac State, uh, which is the Institute for Social Research on Sac State campus, and I was uh, I should do the surveys. I hated it, and then I <laughs> hey, I, still important information, right? Yeah. Like, right. I hate this. Never doing it again. Good life information. Right. Yeah. It was a job, <laughs> and it does. So when I get those calls, I do do the survey because I know what that's like. Yep. It's a quota system uh, for most of them. But anyway, I ended up. Um, becoming a supervisor at, at that position. And then when I went to graduate school, I became a, a graduate research assist, assistant at uh, ISR. And immediately after graduating, I graduated in uh, 2016. Uh, literally that semester, I was uh, I was teaching here on campus, or the next semester teaching here on campus, and the program coordinator for uh, Project Rebell. Amazing. That's so awesome. It was a great transition. I didn't really have to... Nice and smooth. Yeah. Yep, yeah. amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about Project Rebound and what they do on campus? Because they're doing very important work here. I agree. Yes, very important. Uh, so in a nutshell, Project Rebound is a campus-based uh, reentry program. And so to unpack that a little bit, essentially we provide wraparound services for students that were formerly incarcerated. So we help students enroll, apply, um, and graduate with a quality degree. And some of those uh, wraparound services that we provide include, you know, direct financial aid. We try to, um, you know, provide soft skills in terms of going to conferences. Um, and one of the most important, I think, things that I think we do is provide a sense of belonging on mm-hmm. campus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's super important. And oftentimes our students uh, may feel isolated or insulated, uh, feel like they have a target on them, like they have, you know, I fresh out of jail, stamped on their forehead. Mm-hmm. Um, and so having a place and a space on campus for them to come and, like, you know, s- sit and chill with folks that are like-minded, that know their struggle, know what they've been through, um, it's really, really impactful, right? And so in addition to that, we do uh, a bunch of things uh, during the semester. We call them um, bridge events. And so this semester we had a virtual speaker series where we just highlight uh, different issues that are going on uh, within the social justice, criminal justice field, um, and talk about them, right? We try to get experts in their field to come and have a conversation about what's going on and how we can uh, change those things. And so we do that. Um, we have a club on campus as well, Project Rebound Club. That's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we have that's a, awesome. <laughs> yep. We have a Project Rebound Club. Um, and so that's exciting. And they do things uh, on campus as well. And um, so, yeah, that's Project Rebound in a nutshell. We definitely want to focus on and cater to this specific population. Mm -hmm. And so whether you did six months or whether you did 16 years, um, you can all come and be a part of Project Rebound. And we have folks, you know, that had life sentences and Mm -hmm. are now students on our campus um, that thought they would never see the the light of day. And, um, you know, laws and things have changed that allowed them that opportunity. And so education has been a great pathway for many of those folks. And so, it, you know, it's like a labor of love for me to really help people um, see what education mm-hmm. can do. Because for me, it was very transformative and it helped me, you know, uh, transcend um, my social situation. And I think, you know, it does the same uh, for these folks as well. So it's super important. I think this is so awesome. Mm-hmm. I know, um, I mean, I have family members that have had experiences just dealing with the justice system and thinking that life is over. Like, I, this happened to me, I, I committed a crime, and that's it. And so they get released, and then they're not able to get employment, and so they go back to what they know how to do. Because, right. I mean, to be honest, they're making better money than me. I was like, it's lit out here, you know? Pretty much. So I'm like, wow, that's a lot more. <laughs> but you know it's it's um it wasn't sustainable for them and then just the level of anxiety they had and so when i think about this program i'm like wow this program is really changing people's trajectories it's mm-hmm. changing people's perspective on what life can have and it lets you know that you know um not every mistake means it's the end of the world right there's different pathways but 
if you can, can you speak to the range of backgrounds you see in Project Rebound? Like some of the experiences that some of the students have overcome and this mm -hmm. program has just helped to just fulfill so many different dreams. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, it's like where to begin because we have a lot of stories. Um, so, for example, we got a student that literally did 17 years bank robbery mm -hmm. um, and was released. And within two years, now he's in a, a master's program uh, on his way to graduating. That's awesome. Um, yeah, literally, Incredible. literally doing big things. Was featured on a CNN documentary that aired nationwide. Um, and so we have folks that, like I said, have gotten DUIs, mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe spend a couple months in jail, to folks that have life sentences. Um, and so I can highlight some other students that did 23 years. It's a long time. It's a long time. An extremely long time, mm -hmm. <laughs> particularly behind the wall, you know, right. as we say. And so, you know, when they do come to us and you see what they've been through or you hear about it and like the lack of confidence and then six months, a year, once they get acclimated, the amount of confidence yeah. that you see in them is like, amazing it makes it worth it like, right right you know they came in kind of timid kind of scared right not knowing what to expect and then in six months you i mean excited come in chest poked out like yeah you know so i got an a on this paper that's and I'm, amazing I'm doing this and we're going to this conference in new york in two months and so it, it is and so we see a wide range um of students definitely see uh a lot of students with a wide range of backgrounds so uh, you know, women as well, you know, from people from all walks of life, uh, we get, and you would be surprised. And because of that stigma, because of that target, many folks don't want to uh, join Project Rebound, mm -hmm. right? And so I wouldn't say many, but have a significant number would say, well, I heard about you guys, but I didn't want to come in because, you know, the stigma that's associated yeah. with not being a part of Project Rebound, but having a criminal history. Mm -hmm. and not wanting to be judged because of that, right? Because disclosing is a serious thing, right? It's analogous to, like, coming out of the shadows for right. folks that are, right. you know, um, um, undocumented. Right. Because it does change people's perceptions of you, mm -hmm. right? And then that's on top and layered on top of whatever other um, socially constructed uh, defect that you may have, right? That's not true, but still socially constructed, whether you're black, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, a woman, uh, gay, any of those things, right, on top of that stigma of being formerly incarcerated. Totally. Emma and I were talking about uh, labels and media and how they kind of go hand in hand with the way people interpret what you've done. So if you hear somebody uh, has, you know, been to prison, in your mind, you're going to that movie you saw yeah. and you don't even know what they did but you just went exactly. right back to that movie or you know thinking about how challenging it is to create sense of community and thinking okay we're going to call this program project rebound but students have to feel comfortable with the name mm -hmm. i think about like you said students that may be uh, you know with mixed status families or undocumented or students that want to utilize the pride center but like i don't want nobody to know but mm -hmm. i need this service and so it's it's challenging to be able to create a sense of community for folks that also see that label as something that may be harmful or shameful. Yeah. yeah. So I think the program is doing excellent work. It's very unfortunate uh, when that happens. But when they do come in, um, we welcome them into the fold and they realize, hey, it's, it's all good. Right, mm -hmm. right. You're not like blasting your name anywhere. You don't have to be in any photos you don't want to be in, right? And so right. you do have control. It's not just like you're you're here and we're going to, like make you an example for some for someone else. No, you know, you come in, you still have your, your anonymity if that's what you, you prefer. Earlier you mentioned that coming into the system of education following mm -hmm. time in prison, right? Like you're, adap you're adapting to a whole different new system, essentially, mm -hmm. right? How do you see education kind of serving it for this population, right? Like, how do you see education serving as a bridge mm -hmm. between incarceration to employment? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, there's a couple of reasons, or a couple ways in which it is a bridge. Like, this thinking about some statistics that I do have is uh, college grads see 57 percent more uh, job opportunities than those that do not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that have not graduated from college. And um, two-thirds of all 
uh, jobs now require some post-secondary education. And so education serves as that bridge Mm -hmm. to, you know, employment, gainful employment, uh, livable wages. Right. right? So it's Mm -hmm. a difference between having a job and having a career. Mm -hmm. And so when uh, an education allows for that to happen uh, in many regards, right? And so you can look at the unemployment rate, employment rate, unemployment rate for folks that um, have a college degree versus Mm -hmm. those that don't. Mm-hmm. Folks that have a master's degree versus those, you know, that don't, and um, so having an education definitely makes sense. But so, so you were speaking to how yeah. education is a bridge, mm-hmm. right, to access to um, livable wages, to housing, to employment opportunities. I mean, just having a career itself, education can do that. Yes, yes, definitely, uh, and not only that. So I would say um, more than that is that it makes you so much more self-aware, mm. um, so much more cognizant mm-hmm. of some of the things you may have been involved in and then what you're doing now. And so I think that's one of the the most impressive things that I see what education actually does for folks um, because you so we, we live and sometimes we think what we were doing was normal. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Like it's like mm-hmm. wake up and, and smoke a blunt every day or mm-hmm. – chill on the block or whatever like you think that that's normal and mm-hmm. aggression or and or anger is like you sometimes you think that these things are normal and I, you know, education really helps for, in my uh experience help folks see like sometimes the error in their ways it challenges you to um rethink how you think mm-hmm. right and so i think with education the most important thing you can do is be self-critical Mm-hmm. Right. If you want to be a critical thinker, you have to be critical of yourself. Look inside. Right. Mm-hmm. And where do these where does these ideas come from? What is the root of it? That's what my grandmother used to say. Mm-hmm. What's what's the root? Right. You wanna, <laughs> I'm in love with her already. Right. <laughs> if you want to solve a problem, you got to get to the root of it, right? <laughs> and you got to pluck it. And so, oftentimes, what you see is folks find that they find that root mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. education. And it's like, whoa. That's why I think like that. Mm-hmm. Or that's why I've been feeling this way mm-hmm. about how the world is beating up on me, but couldn't articulate it. Right. And so now that I'm in Soch and I'm taking this Soch class, that's what I've been trying to say. Right. It's that's what I've been trying to articulate. Verbiage. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so that's empowering. Right. Because now I can speak to you and tell you what I'm really feeling uh, in a way in which you'll understand it. And I imagine that's incredibly important, not only for your own personal growth, but I mean, we talk about career here at the Hired Podcast, Mm -hmm. right? And so to be able to communicate this in a way that others who may themselves are not just as impacted, right? Who may or may not be, to be able to communicate this in a way that can be understood and is clear and people can have compassion for, I imagine that serves people incredibly well, especially within the hiring process, right? So can you speak to that a little bit of like, if you are just as impacted, when is the appropriate time to bring this up? Because like you mentioned, this can be very taboo or people can feel like I need to hide this until there is no other way to possibly hide this. Right. Right. So can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, most definitely. Um, So we, we tell our folks always be honest. Right and, and up front, but luckily in in California we we are trying to undo a lot of the wrongs that mm-hmm. were done in the past, mm-hmm. and one of the ways in which uh, we're doing that through the legislature um, is through ban the box, mm-hmm. right? And so California banned the box. It was uh, a bill one zero zero eight or one zero zero eight, and it was signed into law in twenty seventeen, and was came law in twenty eighteen January twenty eighteen, and and essentially what it does is it restricts an employer from asking about your conviction history or your criminal history during the application process. Right. Right. Up until you are offered a conditional employment. Mm-hmm. So let's say you have a job where you have, you know, three interviews. It is illegal now for that job to ask you about your criminal history unless they're offering you a conditional employment. And what are those conditions? Those conditions may be you have to, you know, subject yourself to a background check or other conditions. But up until that point, they can't ask you about your uh, criminal history. And so what it does, it it helps you get your your foot in the door, Mm -hmm. right? And so prior to this, 
well, literally, you know, we have protected classes of people, right? Mm-hmm. You can't discriminate on me because I'm black or because I'm a woman or because I'm pregnant, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And so, but if you had a criminal history, you weren't protected. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You could be legally discriminated against. Mm-hmm. Oh, felony, next application. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Felony, next application. Mm-hmm. Not even considered. Mm-hmm. And so this kind of eliminates that and provides some recourse for folks, right? And so let's say you, you go through the process um, and you offered conditional employment. The employer, if they decide in whole or in part not to hire you because of your conviction history, they have to provide you uh, in written information why, right? So they have to provide you with uh, the conviction that essentially eliminated you from that position, mm. right? Uh, <clears throat> And so with that, and they have to provide you the actual documentation, the paperwork mm-hmm. that shows that. And as the applicant, you do have some recourse. So you have up to five days um, to submit uh, mitigating information and or to dispute the information in that report. And so you have to submit that in writing to that employer. And then from there, you have an additional five days to actually produce um, those materials. Right. And so... Um, you do have some some recourse in that as well that you can dispute it. And so the employer must make sure that the reason why they didn't hire you, even if you have the conviction history, is that it's directly related to your job duties. Okay. Right? So they have to consider, uh, is it related? They have to consider um, the time and distance between when you were actually convicted. And so that you know helps folks that were formerly incarcerated to kind of eliminate that pressure that you feel when you know that that question is coming. Right. Because right. it is. <laughs> right. I can almost guarantee you. And it's very deflating in terms of your confidence. Right. There was actually a, a Project Rebound student that came to see me for career counseling. Um, I serve as a liaison in the career center with Project Rebound. So a lot mm. of Rebound students come and see me, and I love working with them. Um, but one student who came in for a session said – I have started six different jobs and within a a few days of me starting, they get the results of my background check Mm -hmm. and I am let go. Mm -hmm. And I just think of how defeating that would be. Right. Right. Of like, I've made it through this process. I have started my job. I have so many hopes and aspirations of this going well. Right. And then to be told, well, this piece of your background from seven years ago is not, we can't hire, we can no longer continue with you and your employment with that. Right. Right. So, uh, it is gut wrenching. Um, I'm glad that the state is starting to implement some of these new measures to try and chip away at some of these things that prevent people from living, fulfilling, productive, happy lives after being justice impacted. And like, so I guess what what I'm getting to, Alton, is you mentioned be honest, right? Because eventually this information is going to come out. Mm-hmm. At what point do you suggest being honest? Do you wait for the background check and then say, here's my explanation? Or do you, you know, later in the interview kind of say, so you're aware, this is what may come up. Let's talk about this so that I can explain. Like, how do you suggest navigating that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um Definitely wait till you're offered employment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So I, that's what I would give. This is the advice that I give. If they give you that conditional employment, right, and you know what's going to come back on your background, you know, save yourself uh, that awkward feeling or hoping or guessing maybe it won't come back because it will, mm-hmm. and let them know. Like, okay, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm glad I've been offered this conditional employment. Um, this is, you know, you're going to find this is what you're going to discover when you do do a background check. Mm. And then you try to, you know, explain the situation and you try to be very um, technical in your explanation, right? Depending on what the charge is. So you always want to be truthful, but there's ways in which you can um, massage it Mm -hmm. or finesse it, Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. to speak, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, be upfront, right? And just let them know what you've done since, then right mm-hmm. so i don't want you to see this as a reflection of who i am as a whole but this is a part of my life and anyone should know that you know you're doing anybody a disservice if you take a part of their life and say this is who you are right right exactly right you know better than that exactly right? if you're going to judge somebody you judge them in whole 
right from holistically the, from for the sure beginning to the end for sure you don't take a part out of somebody's life and say this is who you are that's not fair to them and so um so you try to describe what you've done since then as well as you know what even what led you to that point Mm-hmm. I was uh, on a panel for um, a student panel talking about identity and people that were discovering themselves. And one of the panelists said, I just needed talking points. I really needed someone to tell me a bunch of different ways to describe how I was feeling or how to identify myself so I can actually go into rooms with confidence. And I was like, wow, that's just, that's what we all need, really, from as early as we can. If you can just tell me how to describe this via talking points, I could take that and run with it. Like, we could be (laughs) successful. If I could carry this paper around every day, I would be fine. And And it feels like Project Rebound helps folks find their personal talking points. Like Mm -hmm. this charge is not the end of your life, but let's kind of go over how to describe Mm -hmm. what happened and the skills that you learned because of it Mm -hmm. and how to move forward with this. Because I'm sure there's lessons and teaching points in this experience that happened too. It's analogous to your elevator speech. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's something that you should practice. Here comes Alton coming in hot with that career advice. Yes. <laughs> like, why yes. am I even here? <laughs> you definitely. Just a little extra seasoning. Oh, yeah, you, you know, know. That's it. Dipped in sauce. There you go. So, so you, <laughs> you definitely want to uh, practice that in the mirror. Uh, right. And get comfortable run, with right, that, right? Run it by. Go to the career center and do a mock interview. I mean, this, these things help with your confidence. Right. right. It's already a nerve wracking situation, let alone, you know, you have to disclose. And so definitely something that you should should practice and um, get it down. Well, what other challenges do you feel like folks that, uh, you know, from Project Rebound mm-hmm. or just people that are just as impacted, period, experience just navigating career transitions? Okay, so I got the job. I'm in this career environment. What challenges do you think come up for folks once they've landed their career job? Yeah, um, I that's a great question. And so what I would say is some of the challenges that folks face – is definitely soft skills, mm. right? And readjusting to life in a different institution. Mm-hmm. You just left one, and right. now you're at a different Ooh, institution. That's a good point, right? And so the rules, regulations, and guidelines are different, right? Right. In prison, you don't just walk through a group of people without saying "excuse me." You don't step on someone's shoe. You know, respect is is a big thing. And so when folks are released, they're on campus or they're working a job. Um, those same rules don't apply per se. Right. And so that's an adjustment for people. Mm-hmm. Right. Because those, these things could, in some cases, literally, you know, get you harmed or killed. Mm-hmm. And so that is an adjustment um, piece. Right. And so building those soft skills, which we try to do through Project Rebound, just uh, with the space we have on campus, the different events, going to conferences, networking, and then technology is huge. Mm-hmm. Right. You did 23 years. You. FaceTime. What oh is that? my gosh! Right, right. I can see you when I'm talking to you, like, uh, you know, just writing a proper email. Right, right. Downloading, uploading things that we take for granted now, but right, uh, it's definitely a steep learning curve when it comes to those things and gaps in employment. Yeah, right. Those things can also be uh, posed as a challenge for folks and how to, you know, uh, massage and navigate that uh, resume Mm -hmm. so you definitely need to shoot to the career center and find out if you need to do a chronological one or a functional yes look at Ah, he's been taking notes i see (laughs) we have an a student in the bunch Uh, exactly (laughs) i graduated uh with honors (laughs) (laughs) but uh, so gaps in employment right how to navigate that uh, how to finesse that uh, networking is is a big thing, and I would say one of the hugest things is confidence. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, confidence uh, again is very deflating, even on a, an application when you see have you ever been convicted of a crime. Um, many folks, you know, stop right there. Right, right. Literally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Uh, I just I imagine all of that compounding together and Mm -hmm. then walking into a room for an interview and feeling like you're carrying all of that on your shoulders at one time. And then, you know, you're expected to perform and showcase and look at all the incredible things that I can do and have done. And when you're carrying all of that, like, wow, what a tough task to task to 
tackle. And so I just, I feel like with Project Rebound, giving those folks all the tools to be able to navigate that process is just so incredibly important. And I know Melissa and I were talking about, you know, going into the episode, like many of the things that you mentioned of, you know, if you've been in prison for 20 years and come out, it's like even 10 years ago, everybody had an iPod, right? right? Now everybody's like, who has an iPod? I know. That's like 10 years, right? <laughs> right. And so you you just look at all of these changes, especially with technology and how we do work from a day-to-day standpoint, and it's like, wow, what a big learning curve, right? So I really commend these people for being able to to navigate it and figure it out along the way, right? Yeah, I definitely. think you said something that's really important, too, that we say is sometimes um, this like bridge to more opportunity of promotion And that's networking. Mm -hmm. Networking is already anxiety inducing already. It's already hella weird. Networking with people. (laughs) What do I say? How is my body language? Do I shake a hand? How much small talk can I really make before I'm like, can you just tell me who you are? Exactly. Like, like, can we get past this? Right. And I'm supposed to navigate this and hopefully, you know, do this over time so you'll see that I'm worth the promotion. Oh, my gosh. Mm Mm-hmm. That it can be so stressful. So I think this is just really good perspective. I mm-hmm. agree. Networking is definitely a skill. And I really think they should teach a class on networking because it's, it's an art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have to have a certain type of personality, right, and to do it. And it definitely takes, uh, takes practice. Mm-hmm. And one thing I wanted to mention, right, is that I didn't mention before um, was that we just passed Senate Bill 118 as well which eliminates the question. So basically some 70% of colleges ask about your criminal history just for admissions. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Yes, they do. And so in California, we just passed Senate Bill 118, which eliminates that in both private and public uh, college universities. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a big deal um, in that you don't have to deal with that uh, as a potential hindrance um, to being accepted into a grad program or accepted into a college. There is some exceptions to, uh, like, professional uh, programs where they still do ask about your conviction history. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's trying to narrow it down, as po- make it as narrow as possible. But that is also a hump that many folks with uh, criminal convictions have to get over. And statistics have shown that two-thirds of folks in the application process, once they get to that question, they stop filling out the application. Yeah. I spent some time as um, the advisor for a graduate program that, you know, really basically graduated future clinicians, mental health clinicians. And so their background would actually help them get into the program because they had an affinity for folks or a lot of empathy because they were like, oh, I, I've been there. I totally get it. But when it came time for the internship, it had a background check. And so they did all this work, right? And even the financial aid process can be weird too. And there's been a lot of advocacy about making mm-hmm. sure folks can still get access to aid. But just imagine you went through all this work to get this aid, all this work to get into the graduate program. Here you are, you're in your last semester of grad school. You knocked out a thesis and everything. And they're like, oh, so guess what? It's a no. <laughs> yep. So that that is a big deal. So all this work is like really changing lives. It's a big, big deal. It yeah, is. It's a big deal. Social know how is very important. And you got to have advocates. You got people willing to fight for you. But a mm-hmm. lot of times, the folks in those positions don't know exactly what you can do, mm-hmm. right, with, with your conviction history because it's different for everybody. Right. And so, what we need to do is get out of having folks be gatekeepers and be more advocates. Right. Right. Be an advocate and not a gatekeeper for a lot of these folks. And that's what we have. You know, it's too many gatekeepers. And the excuse is, or the reasoning is, without any evidence, right? Well, it's not evidence-based, but college safety or campus safety. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we have to see these folks as more than their convictions and as their convictions not being uh, an indicator of their abilities to do the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alton, for people who are interested in learning more about Project Rebound or who maybe want to support Project Rebound, where can they go to learn more? Oh, yes. Yeah. So you can check us out. Uh, you can email us directly at projectrebound at csus.edu. Um, you can give us a call as well, 916-278-6794. I would say stop by our office. But, uh, but that's not, COVID <laughs> in this virtual time. <laughs> Pop not, into my Zoom you meeting. Can, right. <laughs> you can drop by our virtual office hours. Definitely do that. We hold those. 
and uh, our website. And so you, I would say the quickest way to get to our website is just uh, Google Project Rebound Sac State, and it'll take you, take you directly to our website. Or you can go to uh, Student Affairs, uh, which we're housed under, and uh, and follow the links to Sac to, to Project Rebound from that mm-hmm. from that avenue. And then, Alton, I know previously you all were doing outreach work by going into different prisons and different facilities throughout California to Mm -hmm. spread the word about Project Rebound, which I think is so cool. And Mm -hmm. we actually, our office is shared kind of like a mailbox area. So I would see a bunch of letters coming in uh, from like San Quentin and different, you know, different facilities around the around the state, which was so cool. So are you all still doing some of that outreach? I imagine, obviously, COVID has probably impacted some of that, but yeah, is that still has. going on? Yeah, it has, but um, we do. Um, as soon as, well, we have stopped because of COVID, but once it um, COVID is over soon, hopefully, then we will resume. Okay. Um, that's something all across California, as far as Pelican Bay, High Desert, we go to in, inside the facilities and promote you know, mm-hmm. education. That is so uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so it's another program that one of our students works for. It's called Insight Gardens Program, where they actually go when people are released after doing, you know, however many years and pick them up, give them a cell phone, give them a meal, mm. and kind of, you know, navigate them or point them in the right directions. And so it's definitely important. And I teach in inside uh, prison as well, but just for another institution. And so, um, yes, we definitely need to go inside and, and reach the people directly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And that, it's fun. It's a little intimidating at first, but uh, it's, it's definitely well worth it. I mean, hungry. Yeah. Hungry. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. And what you don't know, a lot of times people won't tell you. And so we get in there to spread information. Yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. Amazing. What advice do you have for our listeners who are looking to start or shift careers? And this can even be for folks that are coming out of programs like Project Rebound. Yeah, um, I guess it's that old saying, right? For me personally, is a goal is just a dream until you devise a plan. And so if you're looking to shift careers or getting into education, then devise a plan. And I know that's kind of general, but it's true, right? Because it changes for everybody or it's different for everybody. But I would say, you know, think about what is it going to take for me to get this career into this career? Does it mean going back to school? Does it mean getting a uh, uh, cert- certificate? Does it mean uh, volunteering? Does it mean finding an internship? Right. OK. And how can I do that? Right. Where do I access information? Because uh, you may not know. And so a lot of times that's where you need to start. Right? You have these these dreams. You have these goals. OK. Now let's sit down and devise a plan. Now, realistically, how long will it take me to to, to um, achieve that goal and achieve that. And so you set little bite-sized chunks and slowly but surely you tackle them. Mm-hmm. And with each one, the confidence just grows and grows and grows. Mm-hmm. And I'm a living testimony of that, right? So I don't want to start preaching, but... Do what you got to do, Alton. You got <laughs> to do what you got to do. Hey, We're ready. <laughs> Hallelujah. But <laughs> you definitely got to have a plan. Uh, I think for me, once I started to devise plans um, and, and, and execute them, I, I knew I, there's nothing that I couldn't do. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true for anyone. Right? I mean, you set a goal and achieve it, but it starts with, with making a plan. So if you're looking to get into college, uh, you can definitely reach out to us. But if you're looking to change careers, you know, start, start doing that homework. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Alton, thank you so much for joining us today. I feel like this has been such an important, but also really interesting conversation. I imagine a lot of people don't know a lot about this topic. And Mm -hmm. so I'm just really thankful that you are here today to help, help spread the good word and preach the good word. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you guys having me. (laughs) So thank you, Melissa. Yes. Another spectacular episode. There were so many takeaways. Yeah. What do you think was your favorite? To be honest, all of it. Um, What sticks out the most is uh, just thinking about folks that really take the job application process for granted. Yes. And um, maybe don't recognize that there are other folks that would just be excited for an interview. Mm -hmm. Right. That just would be excited to get a job offer. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just important to have that perspective. 
And then also, it's also important to um, know how to advocate for yourself, right? Like things totally. happen in life and sometimes we carry this guilt or shame about it because we feel like the world will ding us for it. But it really is about knowing how to advocate for yourself and showcase the the lessons that have come from those experiences. Mm -hmm. So I really hope our listeners took away some of those really good nuggets. Yes. Yeah. What about you? I think for me, it was so powerful hearing the story about one of the students that, you know, served many, many years in prison mm -hmm. and is now in graduate school. What a right? boss. What a boss. Yeah. And so I think it's just, it gives me hope hearing about some of these different measures that the state has taken, really seeing that we're not just like talking the talk, but trying to really walk the walk is right. at this point of like, let's right. change policy because ultimately policy is what's preventing people from succeeding. Right. And until we address that, you could have a great heart, but if employment law says this, well, it's really hard to overcome that. Right. right. And so speaking to some of these initiatives that are so important within the space, I'm just, I'm glad to see that there's progress, but we obviously still have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work. We to have do. a lot of work to do, but yes. it, it's good to hear that we're, we're making a start. Well, thank y'all so much for listening to another episode of the Hired Podcast. We appreciate your support and we'll catch you here. Same time, same place. Sac State's number one. Stingers up.